Hello, this is International Women's Day 2022 in the municipality of the County of Kings. Please join me in celebrating our home, our country, with the playing of the national anthem. Armstrong, a municipal councillor here in the County of King, and I will be your host today for an amazing group of speakers with inspiring messages. Did you know that from Digby County to the town of Wolfville, almost 50% of ele municipally elected are women? During this forum, you will hear from our Kings County councillors, young, smart, dedicated women with great ideas and a focus on the future. Let's get moving along. Our first guest will speak to us about the importance of empowering lesbians and trans women to be at the decision-making table to advance justice, inclusion, and belonging. Debbie Awosu Akia, Executive Director of the Canadian Centre for Gender and Sexual Diversity. Debbie is an award-winning Black feminist with over eight years of local and international advocacy experience through feminist... Admit, oh, Lord, I'm having a hard time today. Through feminist initiatives in the Ottawa Gatineau region through working at Oxfam Canada and Global Affairs Canada. She became the new executive director at the Canadian Centre for Gender and Sexual Diversity in July of 2020. The centre promotes diversity in gender identity, gender expression, and romantic and sexual orientation in all its forms on a national level through the services in the area of education and advocacy. Welcome, Debbie. Thank you so, so much. Hi, everyone. Uh, I wanted to give a special shout out and thank you to the Municipality of County of Kings for inviting me to join all of you for the International Women's Day event. Uh, it's an absolute honor to share my thoughts and perspectives, especially as someone who has multiple intersecting identities that inform my own womanhood. Um, and so coming into this conversation, I come to you as a Black queer woman who leads a national LGBTQ organization, which I think is, there's something to be said there, especially when you talk about empowering lesbian, queer, or trans women. Um, and, you know, our organization is, especially now that I'm here, is kind of undergoing our own new journey when it comes to fully embodying um, our intersectional feminist values, uh, be it in our programming, our advocacy work, but I think most importantly in our organizational culture. And I think for anyone who's having conversations about equity, diversity and inclusion, board culture definitely, I think starts at the top, but everybody plays a role in it. Um, and so I'm the first woman leader uh, of the CCGSD since its inception. And um, I think it's pretty important, especially for, again, two us LGBTQ people, but in particular, those within our communities that are women to see other women in leadership positions. Um, in the work that I do, 
I often try my best to pay as much homage to Black, lesbian, and trans activists who have been trailblazers in social justice organizing. Um, I often think about the founders of Black Lives Matter uh, who are queer women. I think of Marsha P. Johnson, who was a trans woman who led the Stonewall riots, which um, some people could say are the reasons why we have LGBTQ rights today. And I think of folks like Audre Lorde, who is a Black feminist lesbian scholar who has given us so much of that feminist and intersectional language and framework we use today. You know, as someone who's dedicated to the liberation of my own communities, intersectionality is a framework I try to incorporate in all of my work. It's central to how people, including myself, are able to name nuances and complexities around the oppression that we face. Um, from a leadership perspective, uh, this is a framework that I think is needed to ensure that programs, but I would also say policy, interventions that address homophobia and or transphobia don't cause further harm to the communities we're seeking to support. Um, and I think it's a reminder in my, in my sector, nonprofit sector, but I would say for, for everyone, that when we strategize around programming or policy interventions, that we shouldn't be making decisions that inform marginalized people without them and their guidance, uh, because they're experts in their own lived experience. And I mention this because I think it's pretty crucial having seen some super amazing accomplishments for 2 LGBTQ people in Canada in the last little while. Um, you know, queer leadership has been informed by our lived experiences. And I think it's created so many of those major shifts we've seen. Um, we can go all the way back, but I wanted to kind of talk about some of those most recent ones. I think about the fight for um, some of that historical funding that 2 LGBTQ organizations were able to see in the last two years, um, especially for a sector that has been routinely underfunded. I think of key legislation change around things like so-called conversion therapy that we saw finally pass earlier this year. And I think of some of the new things we're seeing with our communities being able to be more open about our identities. Um, not too long ago, Statistics Canada provided new data that 2 LGBTQ populations here in Canada are over a million, and a third of that are people under the age of 25. Um, and I'm also thinking about some of the significant work that's being done and informed by 2 LGBTQ people being at the table around the federal government's upcoming LGBTQ action plan. So, you know, all of these things that are being accomplished by 2 LGBTQ populations are on top of many of the achievements we're seeing within the gender justice movement. Um, and our movements rely on each other. But I think despite many of those achievements for women um, in leadership roles, and I use mine as an example, there's still a significant level of work that needs to be done to ensure that the marginalization that queer and trans women face don't get in the way of us having access to the table. You know, we still face exclusion and marginalization both beyond and within the women's movement, even here in Canada. Um, you know, I'm still waiting for the day that we'll be able to see an openly trans member of parliament um, one day. You know, I think of specifically uh, trans women in particular who face a significant level of both structural, lateral and physical violence that exists separately from that that's experienced by cisgender queer women like myself. I think in empowering our communities must be done intersectionally. It has to do away with discrimination that intersects homophobia, transphobia, and misogyny, while at the same time putting in the work to center our own voices in decision-making, consultation, and other forms of leadership. You know, empowering us to have a seat at the table is meaningless if that table still has bigotry at it. You know, especially if that table, the figurative one, of course, um, isn't committing, committed to resisting patriarchal norms um, that prevent all voices from being heard and valued. You know, when power invites you to have a seat but prevents you from speaking or eating, if you wanna keep the food analogy, we end up just creating tokens. Um, one of my favorite quotes, and I don't know if many of you have heard it, is that if you don't have a seat at the table, you're on the menu. And I think that's something that a lot of people in our sector doing work regarding to us LGBTQ communities are very, very focused on. And, you know, we make it 
our duty to remind people to have us there at the table. Otherwise, what they're doing around us isn't really going to inform our communities in the way that they'd like. You know, we are community leaders. We've always have been. Queer and trans women have been pivotal, in particular trans women um, and, and BIPOC women um, into building community spaces and the liberation movements that we see today. Um, and they've been critical in shaping our ideas of feminism and intersectionality. And so, you know, valuing our leadership, actively seeking it is key. So to conclude, you know, we should never forget about the achievements of women within two LGBTQ communities. Queer and trans women are important activists, we're leaders, we're change makers, we're trans trendsetters, uh, but we also at the same time doing this work that we all benefit from, continue to deal with exclusion and marginalization. In particular, trans women, and other women who are racialized, indigenous or black have built community spaces and liberation movements that we all recognize today. And they've been critical, and I will always emphasize this, critical in shaping our ideas of feminism and intersectionality. You know, to us LGBTQ women continue to stand strong in the face of injustice, and we have to make it our commitment to share and amplify their voices and visions as we strive for a better world. Um, and to really, really conclude it, I think, you know, women's liberation, what we're all celebrating here today on International Women's Day, it cannot be achieved without two LGBTQ women. And so I implore you all to consider that when you're thinking about it, when you're inviting us into the table, but most importantly, you're working alongside us to build the table. Thank you. Inspiring message. Maybe Sunday you can come down and, and uh, visit us in person, bring that message along with you. I'd love that. Thank you. Our next guest is going to speak to the role of data for achieving the interlinked goals of women, women's political inclusion, economic inclusion, and public and private social equity. Gareth Wall is a policy and research officer at Stevenson Council, United Kingdom. Gareth has worked in international local government policy and research for over a decade. As a research officer for the Commonwealth Local Government Forum, he helped oversee knowledge management across membership of municipalities, national associations, and ministries of local government across the Commonwealth countries of the Americas, Africa, Europe, Asia, and the Pacific. He has been part of a multi-agency research team to delivering research and program work funded by the European Commission, Cities Alliance, UNDP, UN Women, and the University, or sorry, the Westminster Foundation for D Democracy. He currently works as a corporate and policy research officer for his local council in Stephen Hitch, Hertfordshire. Welcome, Garrett. Thank you very much for the kind welcome and uh, uh, greetings everyone from the UK. Um, I think I just shared my screen and hopefully I will bring it back up. Uh, I just wanted to check it was working. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for the uh, invite and uh, I will just quick run through um, this discussion a little bit on data and um, thank you so much Debbie for a, for a really inspiring start uh, on, on this that was in, incredible to hear um, of that um, you know in, in, inspiring leaders, uh, women in, in, in uh, leadership roles which is exactly what we're we're about for today and I feel incredibly privileged to join you um, here. Um, I wanted to just draw a little bit, it's a bit nerdy, but to look a little bit at some of the numbers, some of the data. Um, this can obviously, uh, I'm focusing here on, on elected uh, councillors uh, and, uh, and elected representatives, but obviously uh, women working in local government, women uh, working across other sectors uh, 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 and nationally and, and in the private sector and otherwise. Um, a lot of this uh, discussion can can, can things can um, uh, relate to. So, um, this is a, a, just a, a shot. It's a little uh, dated, some of this information, but it's actually the most recent information that um, we have in the public domain, uh, and I believe it's still not far off um, where we are in some of the figures. So just to have a look at um, uh, uh, women uh, councillors um, across Canada. Um, uh, so currently, uh, it's just it's still under 30% um, of, of councillors are women. In Nova Scotia, um, in 2014, it was uh, uh, lower than the uh, average, uh, the national average was 24 percent um, and we see that there's still 
uh, challenges, um, certainly in terms of uh, getting women into leadership roles, in terms of, uh, of chairs and mayors and, and, and their deputies, um, uh, and still uh, we're a long way from, from equity uh, in terms of um, uh, not just the 30%, but heading to, to the 50%, uh, which is obviously what we'd li all like to be seeing. Uh, just to get a, um, a little bit of a sense um, uh, of where we are with some of this data. So um, it, it may surprise those of you who are, are not uh, working in international local government. Uh, we didn't know how many women councillors there were um, uh, uh, until uh, probably the last couple of years. Um, UN Women have been doing some amazing work at looking at um, uh, uh, women's representation in, in local government. Um, I can send some links uh, afterwards to sh share with participants if that's if that's useful. Um, but uh, within the SDGs, um, we'll know that uh, uh, SDG 5 is, is empowerment of women, but SDG 5.5.1b is women in local government. And UN Women are the agency that are, are tasked with making sure uh, we're looking at how, how that is improving. However, it, we didn't know because we no one was officially collecting that information. Most most countries, a lot of the electoral commissions are not collecting that information. Generally, the data was coming via the national associations um, uh, uh, and, and, the, uh, uh, and, and elsewhere across the local government sector to just see uh, where we are. So now it's starting to come together to get more robust information. So to get a, a sense, um, the uh, data that's used for the Millennium Development Goals um, on women in, pol in, in Parliament, quite well known if you if you look at any of this data, is the Interparliamentary Union uh, Women in Politics data. So you'll have seen the maps where it, show, it shows where there's heads of state that are women currently, or th 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 January 21, I think the, the update will be uh, released today. Um, so I'm just looking at last year's data. There was 13 heads of state that were uh, heads of uh, elected heads of government uh, that were um, uh, uh, that were women. Um, and then you can see how we, the data is starting to get to the more local level. So obviously all that data about um, numbers of women in parliament, uh, national parliaments, uh, deputy speakers, uh, women in, in in parliament. That was quite well known for the last de uh, uh, couple of decades, uh, and we've been seeing those trends um, uh, uh, where they go. Um, in terms of um, women in uh, in local government, um, the report that was released just in January this year um, shows that broadly it's about uh, a third, about 36% across the globe um, uh, 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 of women in, in, in local government. We must remember that that includes a good number of countries, um, uh, I think around a third, um, where there's um, reservation for women in, in, in local government, where there's uh, minimum uh, quotas often around a third. Um, so for large countries like India, a lot of the states there um, have have uh, minimum quotas, and obviously in terms of absolute numbers, that's huge amounts of uh, uh, of councillors and, and and women in local government. Um, we see that um, it, for Canada, um, it's ranked 66 in the world at 26. I know Canada's used to being ranked in the top uh, numbers when you look at development uh, uh, data, um, uh, and so still being below that 30 percent um, is it, it, still means that we've all got work to be to, to be done. Uh, just looking at the data and looking at Nova Scotia, it was that 24%. And just looking at the municipality of the um, uh, County of Kings, um, uh, those of you on the call, I think, uh, I hope I've got some of this right. I think there's four of you out of nine councillors plus the mayor separately. Uh, so I've got that right and there's, uh, so that's 44%. Um, we can move this further and this is the data that is generally missing. So I had a little look at um, your electoral uh, results and things like that, I believe. And again, I'm, uh, you, some of you will know if I've got this wrong. Um, I believe there was five women who contested at the, at the 2020 election, of which four were successful. And so that's five out of 25 candidates. Um, so we see that the women being put forward for local government is still significantly low um, uh, in terms of those candidates uh, across all the parties. Um, uh, and an, also, obviously, an incredibly um, high caliber. You know, four out of five being elected. That's brilliant. Uh, you know, uh, but we need those numbers to be up. We need women to be nominated. We need women to be able to be put forward. Um, so the next slide, um, just to uh, finish off, um, and just look a little bit about some of those barriers and where data is useful for us to be thinking about. So obviously local party selection and looking at uh, the candidate numbers and commitments uh, from local parties uh, looking at the party membership um, most party members are, uh, membership is is reasonably uh, gender equitable but we need to look at that sort of thing and then why is it that nominations are, are still incredibly uh, gender bias um, looking at campaign financing uh, that goes alongside uh, with with 
broader discussions of, of women's equity in finance. So the gender pay gap, um, including particularly the intersectionality of, of issues of uh, ethnicity pay gap um, for um, uh, women of colour and uh, looking at areas of things like counsellor safety, intimidation on the doorstep and social media. These are all, uh, as we all know, really important areas uh, that can be barriers um, for, for engagement, but also uh, there's uh, important data and, and trends that we can be looking at uh, how, how we're addressing these things. Uh, the well-known areas of things like the triple burden, time use trends uh, that the um, uh, Statistics Canada comes out with quite regular updates in terms of um, uh, uh, how household um, uh, unpaid labour is, is being shared uh, inequitably and whether that's um, trending in the right direction um, and particularly that um, area that uh, uh, Debbie so um, uh, eloquently explained in terms of the real importance of intersectionality uh, we're not going to be equitable just by uh, getting um, some more women on on, on on sense it needs to be uh, uh, women with disabilities women uh, 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 of different ethnicities, younger women, uh, and all these um, intersectionalities, uh, and each of them has their own barriers, and each of them has their own data and trends that we need to be exploring. So, so um, finally, just to look at some of these opportunities, um, uh, to finish a little bit on, 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 on more of a positive, uh, uh, the trends are generally in the in the right direction, and uh, the uh, we know that there needs to be greater accountability for uh, for equity, but in employment and employment rights and things like uh, parental leave. Um, uh, and the, obviously, the uh, pandemic, whilst uh, has been absolutely horrific for everyone, there are now uh, much more uh, opportunities for some, those of us in the UK to join you guys to, to do hybrid and flexible working. This should enable greater flexibility, particularly for uh, people who have to work from home, those that are disabled, but be able to join for council meetings and otherwise not necessarily having to, to come into buildings and otherwise. Um, commitments from local parties in terms of women-only slates or uh, reserving specific seats to ensure that there's a certain minimum uh, women on, on councils. A uh, proportion of women candidates is the most obvious one to make sure that, that it's not 20%. Uh, and 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 obviously that, that uh, point about the appointment to, to leadership and cabinet positions is, 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 is a really important one to make sure those incredibly um, uh, in, inspiring successful women are really put up in, in front and people can see that they're actually leading their communities. Uh, but thank you very much. That was just uh, my contribution. I look forward to hearing the rest of the session. Thank you. On getting uh, being equal partners at our table in the next election. <laughs> <laughs> and in saying that, I'm going to bring forward our deputy mayor, uh, a very um, familiar face around here, Deputy Mayor Emily Lutz. Emily lives in Rockland, Kings County, with her husband and three children, and she's seventh generation of the Lutz family farm. Emily was elected in 2016 and 2020 as Councilor for District 7 and has been elected Deputy Mayor by her peers for her entire time in Council. Emily has a degree in Political Science and Philosophy from St. Thomas University and a Master's degree from Acadia in Social and Political Thought with a focus on Municipal Government. Emily also completed the Nova Scotia Municipal Internship Program in the Municipality of Cumberland County in 2012. Emily was Vice President of the Nova Scotia Federation of Municipalities in 2020 and president in 2021. She has also recently taken on the position of executive director of the Nova Scotia Fruit Growers Association. Welcome, Emily. Thank you so much, <laughs> Councillor Armstrong. Um, so welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me today. Um, and I thought today for my presentation, what I would do is just tell a few stories. Am I coming through OK? Everyone can hear me OK? Great, great. Um, so we've got three stories I wanted to share today, and, and none of them are overly long. But the first one I wanted to share um, about being a woman in politics was back in 2016 when I decided to run for election for the first time. And they were hosting a debate at my old high school, actually, Central Kings Rural High. And um, I showed up very eager, very nervous, this 26-year-old ready to take on the world. And I looked up at the stage and remembered being a high school student there and looking at that same stage and seeing a slate of male candidates uh, ready to debate the policies of the day. And when I arrived and I looked up at the uh, the stage, it was still a, a slate of male candidates and me. And I was the only one, uh, I think, under 60 and the, certainly the only woman of about eight or nine members of this, um, this youth debate. And um, so I filled the questions, answered. 
um, answered the questions of all the youth there and, and had a really wonderful time. And at the end was approached by a group of um, probably five or six grade 11 and 12 students who came up to me and said, you know, we didn't expect to see you here today. And we didn't expect to see someone who looked like us. And we certainly didn't ever imagine that we could be politicians or counselors. Um, and it's really cool that you're here today to show us that it's possible. And we thought your answers were the best. <laughs> um, and that was really interesting. And it really, um, to me, was very profound. And it, it made me realize that representation is so important. And it made me a little bit sad that I hadn't had that um, to, to look at when I was um, their age and when I was in high school. And that we actually hadn't come that far um, because there was only one woman on stage and I was the only one there and I was the only youth. So um, it made me feel both a little sad and extremely privileged that I was able um, to be a face for those women to look, look to. But also, um, it was also a lot of pressure in the same moment to say, okay, well, now the hopes and dreams of these women are now resting in my lap and I have to win so that they can really see themselves at the table. And luckily um, I did. And, and that was sort of the beginning of my journey. Um, the second story I wanted to share today is around um, a, a former colleague of mine, Councillor Meg Hodges, and I were on council together on our last term. And um, we both gave birth while serving our terms as counselors, um, her first and then me twice. So in our last term, we both um, were doing something that no one had done before, which was become a parent, a new parent. Um, both of us, it was our second child, so not quite new, um, but having a newborn baby while serving on council. And um, being on council isn't like a regular job. You don't have an HR department and you don't have a maternity leave and uh, you're really only responsible to the voters. And so there was quite a bit of discussion that happened around you know, breastfeeding in council chambers. Would it be allowed? Obviously, it is allowed. <laughs> and uh, But there were certain issues that had to be overcome and conversations that had to be had that had never happened before. Um, in the Municipal Government Act of Nova Scotia, there was no accommodation for counselors who were new parents. So if you missed three meetings, you were off your council, regardless of the reason. And so we were approached by the Department of Municipal Affairs to say, what can we do and how can we fix this? And let's get it in the spring session. So. Six days after giving birth to my second child, AZ May, uh, they, the Nova Scotia government passed an amendment to the Municipal Government Act saying that new parents of, of children adopted or um, through birth were able to uh, be exempt from the three meeting rule for up to a year. So without impacting their pay or their position and with all the privileges of the position returned to them upon their return. So it allowed new parents flexibility. Um, and, you know, we, and we know that that disproportionately benefits women in those positions. And it was a wonderful journey to get there. Uh, our council was extremely supportive and then followed up that change in the municipal government act to implementing policies in our own council chambers about family accommodation, about bringing infants to council meetings, um, having a childcare reimbursement policy as part of our business expenses, the same as you would reimburse for mileage or for meals. So these were changes that only happened because we were at the table. If Meg and I hadn't been there, we wouldn't be having the discussions. There would be no change in the MGA. There would be no family accommodation policy because there wouldn't have been a need. Um, so we had to be there and we had to, to push for these changes and it was a lot of responsibility. Um, but it has made it a bit easier for those coming after us. It's still not perfect, um, but it at least allows those who are looking at council some assurances that um, that they're welcome in some respects and that there's these there's questions that have answers uh, when they're looking at whether or not municipal politics might be a career for them to look at doing or, or a hobby, depending on, I guess, which municipality you live in. Um, so that's the second story. Um, and then the third one just happened a little more recently. So I took a leave from my council responsibilities last summer for a month, 30 days to run in the provincial election. And um, I was unsuccessful, uh, that, which is fine because I'm here today with all of you and back on council. And so during that leave of absence, I was a candidate um, for a provincial party. Um, and in a different vein, you get a lot of targeted abuse when you are running with a color, um, color attached to you, I guess, rather than municipally where you're running sort of on, you know, by yourself. Um, and so I was used to sort of people slowing down and screaming expletives at me as I walked down the street or slamming the door in my face. And it's, it's, a, it's a different beast than a municipal election. And so I was out in the, in the real boonies of Kings County um, on a dirt road, knocking on doors. And I had my big van with my face on it. And 
Um, this van that was driving down the dirt road saw my van and screeched to a halt, slammed in reverse and started backing up down the dirt road. And I'm thinking, oh, God, they really hate my party. They're coming to yell at me. And this woman rolls her window down and says, I have someone in the backseat who's extremely excited to meet you. And I said, okay. And so she rolled down her window and I'm going to, I'm getting emotional and I apologize. I didn't, I, I do every time I tell the story, but she rolled down her window and she had three kids in the back seat, two daughters and a son. And the youngest daughter had received my election flyer and actually taped it up in her bedroom <laughs> and said, I really hope that this person wins. I think she's amazing. I think she was about 10. And she said, I'm just, I see your signs everywhere. We clap and we cheer for you and we want you to win. And you're our hero. And elections are difficult and being in politics is difficult. But that certainly makes it worth it when you are able to be a face for someone to look at, whether it's on a council or even just in an election. And to have the younger generation see themselves as it being a potential, it being a possibility for them to go there and having them a face to connect to that looks like them, that talks like them and that can relate to them and and speak to them on their level. Even just, you know, in that situation as a mom, I could, you know, ask them about their day and and relate to them. And so those are just three stories that I wanted to share today on International Women's Day about just the importance of being at the table um, and just that there's extra challenges in getting there, but also making sure it's a welcoming spot for those who will come after you once you've been there. And there's a there's a responsibility. You don't have to do it alone. You don't have to carry the banner for all women um, because there's a lot of awesome women already at the table ready to support you when you're there as well. So, and in the community. So I'll just wrap that up there. We're really lucky to have such an awesome council and happy International Women's Day to all those on the call. So proud of you all. Thank you, Emily. We really appreciate those stories. We all have some of them. Our next invited guest is going to speak to us about the importance of educating Black and Indigenous women to be at the decision-making table to advance equity, dis diversity, and inclusion. Kelsey Jones is the Director of Indigenous Blacks and Mi'kmaq Initiative at the Shula School of Law in Dalhousie University. Kelsey is the Director, uh, is an I B and M alumni graduating with their LLB in 2014, a native of Amherst, Nova Scotia. Kelsey most recently worked at St. Xavier University as the ACT's African Descent Student Affairs Coordinator. Prior to her time at St. Francis Xavier, Kelsey articled with the Nova Scotia Department of Justice in Halifax and held roles with the Canadian Red Cross and the CBA Young Lawyers International Program. Welcome, Kelsey. Thank you for having me today. So I was asked to speak about the importance of educating Black and Indigenous women to be at the decision-making tables uh, to advance equality, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And in 2021, a report aptly named the Zero Pro Report um, by the Prosperity Project stated that 89% of surveyed organizations in Canada have zero Black women in the pipeline to the leadership level. And 91% have zero Indigenous, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit women. I think we can all agree those are dismal numbers and do not represent the makeup of Canadian society in any shape or form. So why is this? Um, is it that we don't have enough qualified Black or Indigenous applicants? This is a resounding no. Black women, Indigenous women are ready to lead now. And we, and we as a society cannot and will not accept the excuse that we cannot find any of these qualified Black and Indigenous women anymore. The fact is Black and Indigenous women have been very effective at the informal and community decision-making tables in our communities uh, for centuries. Um, they have continued to use their shared knowledge um, organized activism, activism and resistance to oppression and have continued uh, to live our lives in a way that's be best, live our way, um, the best way possible despite navigating implicit and explicit racism and oppression um, that our communities have faced throughout our history. You know, when I talk about this, this topic, I think about my grandmother and I, 
I think about how she had a grade three education. Um, she worked cleaning houses for the wealthy echelon of Amherst. Um, she would walk five, uh, ten, sorry, seven kilometers to work some days to make only three dollars a day. Um, and by far, she was the smartest person I've ever known in my life. Um, you know, she sat on a child welfare board in Amherst going toe to toe with some of the highly formal educated um, ed individuals in town. And she, you know, injecting the needs of the black communities at that time. And she was she did very well advocating um, for her community. But I can't help but think, you know, if she was given the opportunities of her white peers um, in getting a formal education, how unstoppable she could have been. Um, and so we must look at the barriers um, that are deterring the young Black and Indigenous women from accessing educational opportunities. From childhood, Canadian schools can be a hostile place for Black and Indigenous students. Um, many students are streamed into academic levels well below their capacity um, due to teachers' low expectations and biased beliefs. Uh, for, for racialized women, um, these problems can be compounded as they live in the intersection of being racialized and being a woman. Students do not see themselves represented um, in the classes where only history of European expansion is taught and where black history starts with slavery and where Mi'kmaq history is watered down to avoid the atrocities of colonization and the devastation, devastating legacy that continues to impact their communities today. Black and Indigenous students are subject, subjected to microaggressions every day from their peers and educators alike. So schools can be an unsafe place, and this leads to Black and Indigenous students from uh, succeeding, and they are being pushed out. Um, as the IBM initiative uh, director, and my in my previous role as the African Descent Student Affairs Coordinator at St. Avax, I have had first a hand experience guiding black and indigenous women through their post-secondary journey. And it has been my experience that black and indigenous students have a host of barriers, pressures, and obligations that many of their white counterparts do not have to face while getting their degrees. I have students working multiple jobs, not only to support their educational dreams, but to financially support their families as well. I've had students who have been challenged when they ask for accommodations to look after their so-called extended family members, because you know, to our students, they are not extended family members, but they are the people who raised them. Our community, our connection to our communities, um, and our responsibilities and obligations to our communities cannot continue to be seen as a negative uh, by educational institutions, and there needs to be space to accommodate and to praise such dedication. But going back to the topic, our goal cannot simply be to have Black and Indigenous women in leadership roles to advance equi equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, there must be an understanding that Black and Indigenous voices at the formal government company decision-making tables will actually benefit and be beneficial to advance all aspects of the organization, not only EDI. Um, the truth is, despite barriers of, to education, there currently are highly educated Black and Indigenous women who are ready to lead, but are not getting the decision-making leadership roles with the authority to make true change. You know, too many times Black and Indigenous women are tasked to dismantle systems within an organization that are actually created um, to marginalize them in the first place. Um, it cannot be the sole obligation of a Black and Indigenous woman to advance EDI within their organizations. Advancing EDI is an obligation of everyone in all levels of the organization, um, no matter what your role is. Um, you know, Black and Indigenous women all too, too, too often bear the brunt of leading EDI initiatives. In fact, many times they are not given, many times they are given lofty goals and mandates to, to, to reach, but are given no authority to do so and no power to move things forward. You know, the sheer nature of being Black and Indigenous living in, at the intersectionality of race and gender leads to a lived experience that white individuals will never encounter. It is well documented that having diversity of thought at the decision-making tables leads to innovation, 
um, better outcomes for the organization. And furthermore, for, furthermore policy and, and decision making can impact women differently than men. And this is compounded even more if you're a Black and Indigenous woman. So without Indigenous and Black women at the decision making table with the power and authority, you are missing the inevitable insight and perspectives that will lead your organization into the future to better organize, better serve your communities. Um, so with this, I just wanna thank you for inviting me here to speak today about a topic that is so, so near and dear to my heart. Thank you very much, Kelsey. You've just proven that we have uh, a lot of work to do and hopefully all women will come together to get that done. So we thank you very much for being with us today. Our next uh, speaker is um, another local councillor, our councillor Lexi Meisner. Okay. Lexi joined council in October 2020 to represent District 2. Lexi grew up in Hans County and is, was extensively involved in volunteerism with her, within her community and the province as a whole. She was awarded the Queen's Golden Jubilee Medal in 2002. She sat on the Nova Scotia Youth Secretariat, which sparked an interest in politics. Lexi is a certified educational assistant and level one early childhood educator with courses through NSCC for professional development, including organizational behavior, human resources management, the business environment and management principles. She also finished, finished a leadership and mentorship program through NSCC. She is past, passionate about lifetime learning both personally and professionally. Welcome, Lexi. Thank you so much, Martha. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Perfect. Um, so yeah, I welcome everybody. It is so wonderful to uh, sit here and listen to so many other strong female leads speak uh, about what is happening within their communities. Uh, I have to start, obviously, first off by um, acknowledging Meg Hodges and Emily on their um, fantastic contribution to our county. It was through their their work together that made it possible for me to be at this table. Otherwise, I would not have even um, attempted it. I am a mom of three kids um, and I'm a stay at home mom. I work from home. So without their lead, I probably would never have thought it was possible for me to take that position or even envision myself there um, until much later when my children don't need me um, as well, much as they do now. So I do have to bring that back to what Emily was saying about her and Meg, if it was not for their leadership and their determination to model that for um, mothers, I don't think that I would have even taken the risk or uh, looked at the opportunity as something that was even possible for me. Uh, while I was running in the election, we um, there were other females who were running as well, and we all had, you know, spent some time like getting to know each other. And I do have to thank Martha for her mentorship during that process as well, um, taking time to meet with me as a potential counselor at the time during my election to kind of talk to me about what my opportunities were and what could happen. Um, and how to best be a leader throughout the campaign process. So I really think the mentorship piece is integral in, in setting the stage and, and paving a path for other females and other people who identify as female to come forward and be able to get involved in their communities. Um, female representation is really an important piece of success because we need to see ourselves in the room in order to want to walk through the doors. It is essential that we see people who look like us and who have the lived experience to us so that, know, that we know that our authentic lives can be valued and brought forward in places where decisions are made and where we have a meaningful impact. You know, in many cultures, women are the keepers of the culture. They are the ones who pass down the culture, the heritage, the ceremonies and other pieces of the culture and with females at the table we invite more female to step into those leadership roles and and nurture their heritage and the important pieces of um, inclusion that they bring to the table from within their own historical communities we uh, have a lot of immigrants and marginalized communities it is essential for those voices to be in the room to speak about the tradition, the passing down of culture, and that really two-eyed seeing in terms of moving forward with the way that we do things. Um, 
the way that we make changes to include those who otherwise would not be at those decision tables and not include it in those discussions. And if, you know, we want to step away from what has been done in the past, which is, you know, decisions being made to them. We want to have them being included in those decisions um, and not just having to go along with the decision that was made on behalf of them without without any input or necessarily um, positive inclusion in that decision making process. And, you know, as we step away from colonial ways or we identify more colonial ways and ways that we can be more passionate and community focused for you know, our Mi'kmaq culture and uh, communities that we have locally, as well as our historic Black communities, we have to ensure that all those who belong also have a place in the decision-making process. Um, I will be, I am just recently started the Women's Leadership for Community Development through the Cody Institute, and in collaboration with 21 uh, women from 21 other countries, we're kind of speaking about leadership and community involvement and learning about how we can positively bring that back to our community. And I think it really comes back to, you, you know, when you have that ability to mentor your own leadership and and get to know more about your strengths. You bring that back to your community, making uh, more room for other people to step into their authentic selves and take those risks within their own cultures to be a brave person and create brave spaces for all voices to belong. Um, as well, I, I was just recently added to Taking Care of the Valley, which is a steering committee. It's an initiative through Pierce Lab and the Valley Run to benefit caregivers in the Annapolis Valley. Primarily, it will be women in that role. And we're seeing that in order to make, you know, economic recovery, we need to be including those who are adversely affected as a result of what has happened over the last two years in our economy. And um, this does not solely mean parents at home with children. It also includes uh, farm families. As we know in our region, many of our family farms are female led and a lot of those females were struggling to procure childcare and had to step back from roles as farm leaders at the height of our pandemic. Um, my mind goes to two strong advocates in our community, Katie Ketty and uh, Amy Vanderhyde, who were very vocal in this partiality that happened during the height of the pandemic. And we have so many women who have had to step out of careers to care for aging parents or disab disabled family members for their safety and for the for the safety and well-being of their loved ones when the illness was spreading through long-term care facilities that were overrun. And I, I say women, um, primarily it is the women who are affected. We, I do understand that men do take on caregiving roles, but typically we see females in that role. Um, so yeah, I think that all in all, we just need to keep on making opening the door and holding space for other females to join us um, in the decision making process. And, you know, if we want to be a community of, of communities where all people belong, we need to ensure that all people belong beside us. And you know, there's nothing like sitting down beside somebody who looks and understands who you are. So thank you all for your time today. And uh, thank you for all the work that you're doing. It's much appreciated. Thank you, Lexi. Right now, we're going to have a message from uh, MP Cody Boyce. Uh, Cody was born and raised in Kings Hans. He completed degrees in Commerce Law and Public Administration. He was elected in 2019 to the House of Commons and he sat on the Standing Committee on Agriculture and Agri-Food and was elected committee chair by his, by his peers after being re-elected in 2021. Cody has served as the chair of the National Liberal Rural Caucus, and he now serves as chair of the Liberal Atlantic Caucus, representing the region at the National Caucus table. And so our message from Cody. Hi everyone, it's Cody Blois, Member of Parliament in King's Hands, and it's an absolute privilege to be able to join you today uh, to talk on International Women's Day about the importance of having uh, women involved in decision-making uh, and being able to close the gap uh, in diversity writ large. And I'd like to thank Kanisha Gordon, a diversity coordinator at the municipality of Kings County and the municipality itself for putting on uh, this important virtual event. I look forward to International Women's Day in 2023, fingers crossed and knock on wood, 
uh, we'll be back in person being able to do these events uh, directly. But uh, certainly pleased to be able to do this video in the virtual form and, and wish I could be there in person at the time that the event is actually taking place. I'm a believer in women, in their ability to do things and in their influence and power. Women set the standards for the world and in it for us, women in Canada, says to set the standards high. That was a quote from author, feminist, and politician Nellie McClung in 1910. And this quote is a timeless reminder of the power of the female influence and presence in all of our lives. Even in 1910, Nellie recognized how unique Canadian women of all our communities, backgrounds, education, social standing, and aspirations were, uh, and how they are today, 2022, those qualities are even stronger. And having had the privilege of serving in Parliament for the past two years, uh, and, and thinking about people like Nellie McClung, and the fact that it was just over 100 years ago that women were even enfranchised to have the ability to vote in our democracy in Canada, I think is always a stark reminder of the challenges that women have had to participate uh, in those forms and the work that we've done, but the work that needs to continue. Uh, right now, approximately 30% uh, of representation in Parliament is female-based. That We've moved the yardstick significantly, uh, but we still have a lot of work to be done. I want to talk from my experience, having sat in the House of Commons with the female leaders that I get to be, uh, who I get to work with every day, and how proud I am of their leadership, especially in the times that we're seeing around the world presently, uh, and how their leadership and their work is inspiring the next generation of young leaders in King's Hands, particularly young women. Uh, and, and the three people I want to talk about is uh, Melanie Jolie, Anita Anand, and Christia Freeland. Now, it is it bears repeating uh, that in 2015, under the leadership of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, uh, he committed to making sure that we had a gender balanced representation in cabinet, making sure that our cabinet uh, reflected Canadian populace. Um, and look, there was times uh, in 2015 and even beyond that some people criticized that decision. But we look at where we're at right now, um, whether it be the war in Ukraine, uh, whether it be the past two years and the financial implications and the leadership that the government had to take on at the time. And we look at uh, the changing culture that has to happen in our military and indeed our military response to the situation in Eastern Europe. The three major portfolios of the government of Canada right now are being led uh, by extremely powerful women. And I think that that is something we should celebrate. Uh, it is something at the end of the day that uh, we should reflect upon. And uh, I've had, like I said, the opportunity to work with these three women directly. And, and this is no, uh, we have other really powerful women in cabinet as well, but given the circumstances that we're under, this is historic. And think of someone like Anita Anand, who grew up in Kentville, Nova Scotia, um, who was inspired to get involved in public life by meeting Pierre Elliott Trudeau at Greenwood. I'm very fortunate to have a youth council where we have great young leaders. I see every day talking to those young people how they are inspired now by someone like Anita, how they're inspired by like someone like Melanie or Christia. And I think it's extremely important. Uh, I was inspired by Scott Bryson. Uh, I saw myself reflected in him as a young person in King's Hands. Uh, we want young girls, young women in this country to see themselves reflected in the cabinet diversity that we have at the table. And I want to point, it's not just about women in leadership and leading to good uh, decisions and that we're proud. It also leads to better public policy. And I've noticed that in my two years in Parliament from 2019 to 2021, when you have a diversity around the table, the conversations are richer, the perspectives are better in terms of a, a variety of viewpoints such that the public policy that you end up at the end of the day is actually stronger and better reflective of the society that, of course, we all as member of parliament or elected officials are, are trying to represent. We wouldn't have got childcare done if we didn't have a gender balanced cabinet. I, I'm, you know, yes, we have a progressive prime minister. Yes, we have members of parliament that believe in, in social progress, but I'm confident that we wouldn't have got there if it wasn't for the leadership uh, of some of our key uh, female cabinet ministers uh, at the federal level to make that happen. 
That is making a difference in the lives of women and young families across the country. The $10 a day childcare, the Canada Child Benefit, uh, I could go on, uh, but it is extremely important and, and I've been able to see it firsthand. We don't have to look to the government of Canada or federal parliament to look at women leadership. We can just look right in our own backyards. And I think it's important to note that a majority of our uh, local leadership at the local level is being handled by three tremendous women here in King's Hands, uh, Mayor Sandra Snow, uh, Mayor Wendy Donovan, and in my home or my municipality in East Hands, it's Eleanor Rolston, who serves as uh, the warden for the municipality of East Hands. Three shining examples in local governance of the amazing leadership uh, that we have right here in our backyards uh, to help make a decision, uh, make decisions for our local community uh, at the local level. Uh, whether it be small business owners, uh, the, the leadership I see at the Chamber of Commerce um, here in Kings County uh, at the Annapolis Valley Chamber of Commerce, I should say, um, whether it be Angela Carver and others in uh, Windsor who are helping lead the charge on that side, um, or even in East Hands uh, with the strong membership that we have there that includes female entrepreneurs. Uh, we don't have to look to federal government. It is in our business. It's in our local governance. It's in our nonprofit institutions. Indeed, I just talked about childcare, the importance of female-led businesses that are providing that important service as well. So I, look, I could go on. I think I have only just about seven minutes and I don't have the time, but I, I, I just simply want to say uh, it's a privilege to be here today. And, and, and I want to talk about male allyship because look, I am, I am privileged white male. Um, I came from a family uh, where we were paycheck to paycheck. I didn't have a silver spoon in my mouth at a young age, but just by the color of my skin, just by the fact of my gender, I've had privileges that others have not. And I think it's important uh, to not just have women in the room talking about the importance of women, women leadership. We need men that are talking about how important it is to have women around the table to be part of those decision making and to be leading. And uh, I wanna commit to all of you today on the screen that uh, I am fully on board for that. Um, always welcome ideas about how I can be a greater advocate in that domain. Uh, again, going back to Parliament just one quick time, one of the things that I think is gonna be valuable in the days ahead is COVID-19 has changed the way in which we've been able to do Parliament. And this is not often talked about, but the fact that we've been able to do virtual Parliament and be able to transition between doing some of our work in person in Ottawa and then sometimes having the ability to do it at home because of the pandemic, I think is a great tool that we should consider keeping and not and keeping beyond the pandemic because it's going to allow for a family friendly parliament, not only for uh, men who might have young children and being able to spend more time at home and, 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 and around their families, particularly for young women, if we want to make sure that we take that 30% and get it closer to 50% of representation in Parliament, it is extremely difficult for young women who uh, are maybe trying to have families to be able to balance that and be able to be traveling and being in Ottawa. And so I think that this is an initiative that we can move forward that will allow and encourage more young uh, women and women in general to get involved in federal politics. Um, that is one thing of the many that I can do to try to champion to say, how can we uh, look at the way that our institutions are structured to make sure that they are more uh, amenable for having the participation and diversity that Canadians would expect. So again, I might be closing in on my seven minutes, but I just wanted to say thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Kanisha and team and the entire municipality for putting this on, Mayor Matart and Council. Uh, and uh, I look forward to continuing to be that ally in the days ahead. Reach out anytime if I can be of assistance and happy International Women's Day. Thank you very much, Cody. We appreciate your message and your allyship. We're going to move straight along to our next guest, <laughs> Lucy Slack. Lucy is the Secretary General of the Commonwealth Local Government Forum. Having worked for the organization since 1999, she is responsible for policy, which contributes to the strategic direction of the organization and takes a leading role in the development and management of CLGS capacity building projects. Her specific areas of expertise are decentralization, intergovernmental frameworks, local economic development, local government finance, and inclusive local government. 
She is responsible for managing the work of CLGS program and relationship building and advocacy work with members and partners across the Commonwealth. She directs the work of CLGS regional offices in Fiji, South Africa, Ghana, India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Trinidad and Tobago. And she has also been pivotal in the design and management of CLGS biannual uh, Commonwealth local government conferences. Before CLGF, Lucy worked for the Local Government International Bureau, the International Section of Local Government Association of England and Wales, where she was responsible for the day-to-day -day management of a UK government-funded program of support to local authorities in Central and Eastern Europe. She also worked for a number of years in planning and economic development department of a local authority, before which she was living and working overseas. She has a BA in German and politics from the University of Brantford. Welcome, Lucy. Thanks very much, and, and thanks, colleagues, for the invitation to celebrate International Women's Day with you. Let me wish everybody a very happy uh, International Women's Day. Um, and it's a very auspicious panel to actually follow. And much of what I was going to say, you guys have already said in spades. So I'm going to try and just slightly mix it up a little bit from perhaps what I was planning to say um originally and i'll i'll keep it short i promise because uh I'm, I'm conscious we're coming to the end of our time maybe just very quickly our organization covers uh 54 countries across africa asia caribbean pacific and europe including obviously canada as a member of the the commonwealth and we're a membership organization so our members are drawn from individual cities and local governments local government associations, so in Canada, FCM is a member, and ministries with responsibility for, for local government. So it's really good to, to be with you and, and to join you um, today. And just to give you a bit of a sense of that kind of geographic spread, there's 32 small states in the Commonwealth, so that's countries with populations of less than 1 million. There's 2.5 billion people, and that's 60% of that 2.5 billion people are under 30. So it's a very young kind of uh, Commonwealth. Uh, obviously, about 50% are, are women. And uh, I wanted to really talk to you today uh, about some of the things that we're doing, but also some of the sort of uh, frameworks, if you like, that kind of support uh, greater women's empowerment across the Commonwealth. But I want to start just with a couple of quotes. Because obviously, you know, on International Women's Day, you always get lots of kind of organizations and agencies releasing uh, quotes and, and, and statistics around, uh, around uh, gender and women's empowerment. And I hope you won't think that just because we come from the UK, we're obsessed with stats. We're really not. Uh, but I do think that, you know, this has been a hugely uplifting discussion. And I think that that's incredibly important. And particularly, it was great to hear your MP speaking so positively about allyship, because I think, you know, the first point, and this was something you said, Emily, about you need to see it to be it, is something that we hear across our networks all the time. If you don't see yourself reflected in positions of leadership, it's very difficult to think about how you're going to be able to get there yourself. And as your MP so eloquently put it, gender isn't just about women. We tend to focus on International Women's Day on women, but gender is and gender equality, more importantly, is not about about women. It's about all of us. Um, and it's about making better public policy. It's about making better decisions. And I think, yes, we do need to have our male leaders support us. But I think we also have to really think right down to the to the young level of how do we how do we educate our boys and our young girls and our young boys to understand about equality, to not fall into the trap of of, uh, you know, uh, boys and boys and girls, boys can do this, girls can do this and never the twain will meet. I think, you know, we all have that responsibility. And uh, I was at the local government association this morning. So the, the FCM's counterpart in the UK this morning, and uh, they were talking about um, the gender pay gap in the same way as you've been talking about the gender pay gap. And actually, there's an there's an organization in the UK that's called Pregnant Then Screwed. You probably I'm sure you you may you may even have heard of it. But what they do is they say it's not really a gender pay gap. It's just really if you strip out the women that don't have children, that gap closes very tightly. 
it's actually a, it's actually the cost incumbent on women of providing childcare, maybe having to take a demotion because they can't, you know, maintain the same level. It's 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 not actually a gender pay gap. So our employers have a hugely important role to play, and it's great to hear some of the ways in which you know you've been kind of um, influencing that. Uh, I'll share a little bit from some of our Commonwealth members on how other communities have done that. But I think this brings me full circle to my statistics, which I promised you right at the beginning, which is to say that only globally, and this is a global poll that was done by Ipso, globally only 44% of people believe that women are treated equally at work. And I think that really shines a light on many of the things that you've been talking about here in terms of equality and how we turn equality around and how we actually make sure that the local governments that we've got are not just looking like us, representing us, but taking decisions that meet the needs of everybody in the community. And then my second statistic, which kind of is a bit the sort of flip side of that, which says that globally, 47 percent of people believe that gender equity has gone too far believe they've already believed we've gone too far and yet we know in our sector how much further we have to go and the final stat is one that the world economic forum often kind of brings out which is to say that you know it's 135 years before we'll reach gender parity and if you read some of the statistics that have been coming out today that it would say that we've actually gone backwards probably as much as 40 years because of the impact of COVID on women in the workplace, women in political leadership. So I think, you know, it's it's wonderful that we're coming today. It's great that we're celebrating. But I think as many of the speakers before me have said, you know, we still do have a way to go. And that's why it's so positive that you're coming together as a council, as a community to say, OK, so what can we do differently? And I think um, I, I think that is really if we can use International Women's Day for anything, that's a brilliant way to use it. Um, I would like to just talk a little bit about the global context, because obviously my background, my context is thinking about where um, local government fits into the global context. And, and uh, Gareth uh, mentioned the Sustainable Development Goals. The Sustainable Development Goals, they feel very esoteric. They feel like something that maybe doesn't actually impact on us in Canada. But actually, you know, the Sustainable Development Goals were agreed by all of our governments and they're universal commitments to reducing inequality. Um, and it's great that there is a universal goal. So there's a universal target for us around reducing uh, inequality, particularly around gender, which I mean, that speaks a bit to my earlier statistics in the fact that we've got a long way to go. But I think it also speaks to the fact that we recognize that we need to make change and change is is coming and has to come. And uh, SDG five and the the target on women in in local leadership, you know, was very nearly knocked off because it was very difficult to do, as Gareth has said, because it's very hard to compare local governments in different countries with each other. So I think if we if we reflect on how often we say, oh, there's this many parliamentarians, how great is it going to be in five years when we can say, and there are this many local leaders, there are this many mayors, there are this many uh, local councillors. So I just want to pick up a little bit on um, a few points that, that colleagues have, have made and just kind of put that into a slightly um, kind of international context. Um, as an organisation, we've set up a women in local government network, which is really designed to kind of bring women leaders uh, and uh, women in local government from around the Commonwealth together. Um, we've decided to focus on four kind of main areas. One is working with existing women. So working with those women who are already in local government to, to build their capacity to, to strengthen and, and support them in the work that we're doing. Um, and then particularly to work with young women and think about how we can um, make opportunities, create opportunities for young women to think about coming into politics. How can we uh, help local government associations to open up some of those opportunities, supporting junior councils. Um, somebody mentioned that today. And, and really thinking about how we need to invest over the course of that whole kind of electoral cycle. It's not just doing something immediately before the elections take place. It's actually thinking about that whole electoral cycle and how we bring uh, new women and, and, and uh, younger women into, into local government. And then, as we know, there's lots of really challenging systemic issues that we face, uh, maybe not so much in, in Canada at the local level, but thinking about the 
importance of changing the way in which political parties make their selections, encouraging political parties to be much more open about um, putting women onto party lists and, and nominating uh, women as their their um, candidates and supporting them uh, through the election process, and particularly economic. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, campaign finance, which is another really, really challenging barrier to many women, particularly in developing countries where, um, you know, election campaigns are pretty unregulated in terms of how much money you can spend or you have to spend. Um, and you're expected to pay for things even once you're once you're in a position of um, authority, once you are a councillor, you know, the, the situation is quite different. And on that point, I think, you know, one of the other things that we do as an organisation is we support local economic development. And I think the other thing that we really need to think about in the context of women's political empowerment is how difficult that is if women are not economically empowered. You know, if women don't have uh, employment, if they can't find um, the resources to run their campaign to cover off some of those childcare responsibilities that they have, it's very unlikely that they're going to be able to step into politics, even if they really, really want to, uh, without some kind of support behind them. And, and that's a really, really challenging one. And I think one that we would really like to talk to other um, countries about. And then finally, how we can kind of really continue to push at the international level to um, to to make change and to look at how we can use the experiences of councils like yours, local government associations like FCM and others to really influence how we do things differently and how we can start to move the dial on getting more women into political leadership at the local level. So um, things like networking women, things like mentoring women, I've heard that a few times today as well. The value that women get from that mentoring opportunity is extensive. And I think it's not necessarily something that costs a lot of money. It's something that requires um, organization. I've mentioned local economic development and I think that peer to peer support. And I think one of the things that, you know, we've seen very positively over COVID is the, the fact that we have been able to work virtually. We have been able to use digital means. But I think also, particularly in the sphere of politics, we've really missed the opportunity to talk to our counterparts to actually get that peer to peer support from other be it women councillors or, or other councillors um, in leadership. I could go on, I'm not going to because I know that we're coming to the end, but I would urge you to take a look at our website to join our Facebook, a Facebook group of women in local government across the Commonwealth. Um, and today, you know, we're shining a light on what women are doing in terms of political leadership, in terms of building more inclusive communities. And I think just in closing, I want to just look forward and think about what we need to be focusing on as we go forward. And I think one of those things is climate change and the role of women in climate change. I think we all know that the impact of climate change is disproportionately higher for women. Um, I think if we look at issues like agriculture, uh, migration, water, health, all of these things are areas that really impact on women. So I think as political leaders and as people who have the ability to bring these things into the into council or into the public eye, I think we really need to have a strong focus on thinking about the impact of climate change on, um, on women. And I think maybe finally also, we're, we're in a rural area, um, talking in a a relatively rural part of Canada right now. But I think if you think about the sort of changing nature of um, living generally and the urbanization of communities, I think we also need to think about the impact that that has on women, whether they're women in rural areas or in urban areas. And I think these are two places where we probably really need to be thinking about the future. So just in closing, thank you so much for the opportunity to join you. For, to bring a bit the voices of some of our women from other countries in the Commonwealth who are celebrating in exactly the same way as you are celebrating and wish everybody a happy International Women's Day. Thank you very much, Lucy. I certainly appreciate everything you've said. Um, our next, we're going to close this out now with the big boss. <laughs> <laughs> our mayor. Oh, Peter the church. Mr. Mayor resides in Stars Point near Port Williams with his wife. 
and he was elected our first Kings County Mayor in 2016 and re-elected re in 2020. He's a founding partner of Matart's Law Firm in Kentville. He's Queen's Council. His service to the community and recognitions know no bounds. With an impressive list, too long to read. We don't want to make him blush. Uh, he is a trained mediator. He's ranked. He was ranked for more than 15 years by the Martindale Hubble International Lawyer Ranking Service as BB Distinguished. He was awarded a Merit Award as a Rotary Paul Harris Fellow, a Volunteer Award for activity with the local arts community, and a Lifetime Achievement Award with the Eastern Kings Chamber of Commerce. So we welcome Mayor Matar. Thank you, Martha. Uh, so much has been said. Uh, I'll begin with Happy International Women's Day. Uh, but let me, uh, if I may, wander a little bit and, and talk about things locally, because I think it's important that we recognize, especially the uh, women leaders within our own little community here. We, we stand in a community uh, for those that are guests that have not uh, been familiar with us before, of about 60 odd thousand souls. And uh, there are three incorporated towns and this incorporated municipality, and then there are seven villages uh, and growth centers. So they're all uh, populated areas that require uh, in both here and there in each of those places, leadership and in each of those leadership positions you will find women. And uh, so let me begin with a positive message, uh, a particularly positive message of way, the way at least people internationally uh, looked at us back in a study in 2012. Isn't it silly? We have to go all the way back to 2012 to refer to these things. But in the survey of uh, 370 gender experts from around the globe, Canada, was ranked as the number one country for women to live and work in. And to have a better quality of life, better job opportunities, and more freedoms than in any other country in the world. That's what those folks said about Canada that many years ago. So in all of, uh, and, and uh, excuse me if I uh, look down at notes, it, if people allowed me to ramble, uh, I wouldn't be constrained as the folks in this room wish me to be constrained, so I, I'll do this. But uh, some things that need to be said, especially in a community setting. Uh, all of life's journeys, politics uh, must have, in all of those journeys, politics must have all perspectives represented and all voices heard. And in the vast majority of cases, it's the female voice, excuse me, gentlemen, but it's the female voice that adds balance to every decision that's made at our table. And at the many other tables that I've had the privilege to sit at. Uh, in this region alone, we have the following mayors in the region of Queen's Municipality that we're talking about Nova Scotia now. Uh, Darlene Norman in the town of Annapolis Royal, Royal Amory Boyer in the municipality of Colchester, Christine Blair in the town of Kentville, Sandra Snow in the municipality of the district of Lunenburg, Carolyn Bowler getson in the town of Glasgow, Nancy Hicks in the town of Port Hawkesbury, Brenda Chisholm Beaton, in the town of Wolfville, Wendy Donovan in the town, in the town of Yarmouth, Pam Mood, and in the Cape Breton Regional Municipality, Amanda McDougall. In this King's region, we've had pioneers in, in municipal politics, and they included Gladys Porter, who was the first female mayor of the town of Kemco, and Gladys was uh, way ahead of her time. Uh, no one um, that I'm looking at now, or many of whom don't uh, follow the political scene as it's uh, in the days when females were first entering it, Gladys was one of the true pioneers. She later went on to become a member of, uh, of central government. 
And uh, here in the municipality, Opal Parker was the first female councillor in this municipality. And since uh, Opal, we've had Diana Brothers, who was the, uh, I believe to be, the first uh, female uh, warden of this municipality. Now changed the mayor system. And uh, at that time, when, when she served, there was the deputy warden, was also a female, Janet Newton. And we've had Anna Allen, who was uh, the mayor of uh, the town of Windsor. So today, as we stand here today, uh, as it's already been mentioned, the municipality of the County of Kings has 10 people at the table. Uh, so it's nine, rep nine councillors representing districts of about 4,500 people each and the mayor. So of those uh, nine councillors, four of them are female. Lexi Meisner, June Granger, Martha Armstrong, who is your chair for today, uh, and Deputy Mayor Emily Luce, from whom you have heard. So, so much, as, as other speakers have already said before me, so much has, has been said before them that it's an opportunity now to be uh, uh, more brief. Which I'm sure you will appreciate. But to be an instrument of change, uh, I think it needs to be said if you step out on that platform, uh, it's risky. It's, there's pushback when you want to become an instrument of change, and there's criticism. It takes courage. And Emily has spoken of this in her endeavor, her first foray into provincial politics. It happens at municipal politics level as well, but uh, you've heard what she had to uh, encounter at that one. And yet she took it in her stride and she was encouraged in her path. It takes that kind of courage, but it also takes allies. And that has already been mentioned, but it cannot be mentioned more times than it should be. Uh, allies are essential to enable one to openly challenge uncomfortable truths. But, you know, one must ask themselves, why must we wait to be challenged? Why is not every field open to all humankind? I don't quite get that. I know we evolved. Uh, but the time's long past that we should, all, everyone should have acknowledged this by now. So it's evident, therefore, that we need to speak out on this day and on every day of the year. This day happens to be about gender equality for women, not just in Kings, not just in Canada, but all over the world. It's the International Day of the Woman. In some places, uh, Canada is not, uh, not a glowing example in this regard, but it shines somewhat uh, amongst the dimmer stars. Uh, you know, there hasn't, it hasn't been that long that women have had the suffrage, granted suffrage, and were able even to vote to have gone to front. So, took us so long to get to that point. That's an embarrassment, but it's one that teaches us as we go forward. And if you can only carry that knowledge and keep speaking the message, keep being the ally to women who want to enter the political arena and every other form of progressive endeavor. Allies of all genders and ethnicities can help achieve that goal. And it will make the world a better place. So why would we not? I have more notes. I'm not going to refer to them. I'm just going to thank you for the opportunity to address those. Those few points, and uh, to have thanked all of the speakers that came before me, I, I did uh, I said that I wouldn't say anything more. I did make a couple of notes concerning other people's comments, but I'll, I'll uh, 
I'll keep those to amendment. I did want to express my thanks to all of you, Debbie, Gareth, Emily, Kelsey, Cody. I thought Cody was, was banging on on his allyship uh, piece, uh, and, and I would only have said to Cody had he been here, if only Russia had the advantage of a woman's perspective, uh, we might be in a different place today. Uh, Lucy, thank you so very much for your uh, presentation. It's uh, very good of you to have accepted our invitation. I, I noted your comment with 135 years of stats. Uh, uh, if it takes us 135 years, God help us. Uh, but those stats are always, uh, in my experience, based upon uh, the demographic predictions. And all demographic predictions are subject to interrupters. Let us all be the interrupters. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I want to uh, bring this to a conclusion. I want to thank you all for your messages, advice, and encouragement. We've reached the end of our invited speakers, and I've been given a few minutes to add my voice to this conversation. But it will be very short. <laughs> I was off for five minutes. I think this probably all coming in a minute and a half. Uh, my journey to municipal polit politics was happenstance. Nothing I prepared for, uh, certainly nothing I aspired to. I'm a little bit older than the women you've heard from today. And I was approached to do this because my business experience taught me to speak my mind and stand up for myself and others. Those things have served me well, along with the support of my family and friends. So I'd like to offer just a piece of advice, not just to young women, but to all women who are seeking a goal, a path, a journey, not just in politics, but just in the world in general. And if I, it's cliche, but it's simply you do you. You hear it all the time, but if along your path, you drop the traits that make you who you are, the person who achieves the goal is not you. Don't forget to be honest, dependable, committed, respectful. Be a, uh, seek a mentor, be a mentor. Speak your mind with the knowledge that you are truthful and do it with kindness and diplomacy. The respect of others is valuable, but self-respect is invaluable. Before saying goodbye, I must thank Kenesha Borden and Brittany Mastriani for bringing us all together today as well as our amazing staff here in the municipality of the County of Kings. This is one day a year that we celebrate women with speeches and cake. Perhaps we should do it every day in a less formal, but still meaningful way. I thank you all for coming and have a wonderful day. Pandemic mode. <laughs> well, we each get a nice. Yeah, we each get a nice. Wonderful. Yeah, we're not getting married. Where are we? <laughs> <laughs> Let's do yeah, it here. Yeah, let's start. Shall here. we? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, that's it. Oh, Jesus. But we're good. <laughs> Thank you all. <laughs>